asked her what was wrong, and she said something along the lines of, the man with the black eyes was there. When I continued to pry, she looked up at the second floor stairs, her eyes getting big, and looks at me, bringing her finger up to her mouth and said, shh, while shaking her head no. That was also very short. There should have been more to it. Okay. This is the trickster, as told by Reddit user Scarlet Beeswax. I lived in this house with a basement, and every time I walked up the stairs, I would get this weird, creepy goosebumps feeling on my back. It didn't make me uneasy to go down the stairs or to be in the basement. My craft room was down there, and I spent a lot of time there. After a while, I would have items I was using disappear when I would look for them. Oops, sorry. When I would look away from them, I would search and search, and one day I got frustrated, and to no one in particular, I said, Arg, can I please have my scissors back? I had just looked under the pile of new mail, and when I turned my head, there were my scissors on top of the pile of the mail. I read that wrong. I talked to my neighbor, and she told me that the original owner of the house was a jolly old man who loved to prank people, and that he had fallen coming up the stairs one day and died. I think the goosebumps were him trying to tell me to be careful, and every time after that, when something would disappear, I would politely ask for it back, and it would appear in a place that I could have not missed it before. Thanks, old man. It was fun. I've told you guys a few stories of that happening to me, but the one that stands out the most, I was upstairs in bed. I had to go to the bathroom. I came downstairs. I go back upstairs to the bed, and right where I was laying was a spider ring, a big black spider ring that I didn't even know I owned. Something had placed it there to intentionally scare me, but had a sense of humor. It wasn't my family. I was up there alone. Okay, this one is, hang on, Unwanted Tenants, by Reddit user Vanilla Gorilla. My daughter was four years old when we lived in our last home. I was a single mom at the time, so it was just she and I alone in the home. I always got an uncomfortable feeling in her room, near the closet area, but never thought much of it, until one evening I had put her to bed. And I was, as I was doing chores, I walked by her room and heard her whispering. I listened for a bit, thinking she was talking to herself, but it was definitely a two-way conversation with her saying, uh, -huh, okay, stuff like that. I walked in and asked her who she was talking to. She smiled uncomfortably and said, no one. I took her out into the hall, and she wouldn't say anything, but I could tell she was afraid. Finally, we went outside of the house. She said there was a man in her room who didn't want us in the house, and he told her this and to tell her mom to leave. I moved us out a month later. She has not ever since had an episode like this or talked to any ghosts. On to the next. Family reunion, as told by Reddit user Big Jawa. <laughs> One day when my daughter was two, we were having a typical terrible tooth moment. She was throwing a bit of a tantrum for about five to ten minutes, and we couldn't get her under control. At some point, she rather suddenly stopped and started staring at the wall. She then started lightly giggling. It was weird. One second she was crying and screaming, and the next she's smiling and happy. Then she started saying, funny lady, over and over. We asked her who she saw, and she pointed to the wall and again said, funny lady. When we asked her to describe who she saw, she described my deceased grandmother. I mean, exactly described her to the T. She had never met her, and I don't think she's even seen a picture of her. Not a bacteria or could remember a picture. I am not much of a believer in the paranormal, but I know for sure that my daughter got a chance to meet my mom, and that makes me happy. When I told the story to my parents, they didn't seem as shocked as I was. When I tried to get a response from them, they looked at me and said, I guess you don't remember that you met your deceased grandfather when you were three. The same exact thing happened to you 30 years ago. That was creepy. Okay, um. The Guardian, as told by Snap Judgment on, Re on Reddit. I had been on the phone with my boyfriend, and he said something that made me think he was chauvinistic. 
autistic, not nice person. And I remember, I'm sorry about swallowing. And I remember telling him that if he knew anything about me, he knew exactly where I was going to go. And I hung up the phone and got in my car. I drove to the park. The sun was kind of down, down below the tree line, but it wasn't dark yet. I pulled into the parking lot. I thought it was weird that there were two cars pulled side by side and talking to each other. When I got out, the guy in the truck just stared at me in a horrible way. You know when someone just looks at you like they're looking through you, as if you don't exist? I thought, well this is weird, it's late and no one's ever here. And then I thought, whatever, they're leaving, I don't care, I have my own problems. I only took my keys with me because I didn't want a big purse banging around. I headed across the field, which you have to cross through to get to the woods because there's no trail. I was taking my time and calming down, and then I realized it got really quiet. I didn't hear birds and squirrels anymore. I just heard something big moving through the woods. I thought to myself, maybe it's a dog, and then I heard voices. The first voice is a male's voice, and he said, I know I saw her go this way. She couldn't have gotten that far. Then the second voice comes, and it's quieter, and says, shh, she'll hear you. That is creepy. Okay, oops, sorry. So there are two men in the woods, and they're looking for something, obviously. And I kept thinking it must be their dog. They must have lost their dog. And then I thought they wouldn't try to sneak up on it. I stood there frozen, because that's the kind of person I am. I could hear them getting closer to me. I don't know how long I stood there waiting for them to get to me, but I was completely frozen, and then I heard the other voice. It was distorted, like if you heard someone talking through a closet door or talking underwater. That gives me the creeps, you guys, because that's exactly what EVPs sound like in my house, or voices in my house. It sounds like an old radio show or underwater. That creeps me out. Okay, it says, you could understand what they were saying, but the voice wasn't right. It wasn't in my head because I had a volume and pitch that changed that my thoughts definitely don't do. I could almost feel where it was coming from. It was behind me and a little above, like it was taller than me. It just said, go to the river now. I don't know if I was more scared of the fact that there's some disembodied voice or person talking to me, or there are guys in the woods. I listened to the voice because I really didn't have other options. I took off toward the river. I made a ton of noise because I was just going as fast as I could, and the voice came back and said, no, quietly. I got to the river and jumped down the embankment. I squished myself against it, squeezing down into the smallest, tightest ball I could. The voice kept telling me to stay, and I just sat there hoping whoever was in the moods they met Woods was going to leave, and that I wasn't having some kind of breakdown. And I kept hearing them moving through the woods, and I could tell they had split off. As I sat there, the voice just kept telling me to stay and be quiet over and over and over again, like it was trying to comfort me. I could hear what sounded like someone was right above me, and if I leaned out, they could see me. But I had to look. I just tilted my head up a tiny bit, and I could see the tips of these construction boots hanging over the edge, and I could see hanging next to them this dirty old rope, just swinging next to them, swinging. I don't think I even thought anything. I was so scared. I just tried not to breathe. It felt like hours, but I know it couldn't have been that long. The voice even was completely silent. There was nothing but me hearing this man breathing. He started to walk away at some point, and the voice kept telling me to wait, so I waited. And finally, the voice said, go. Now to the field. Go now. I was screaming. It was screaming at me so loud. So I ran through the woods and just got out of the field, far, far from the cars in the street. It was getting dark, and I could see the parking lot, but it was so far away. I'm running, and I started hearing footsteps running. At first, they're farther away, but they're so much faster than I am, barreling after me, and there was nothing I fully expected to see at least one of the men. I'm sorry. And there was nothing. I fully expected to see at least one of the men. But there but there was nothing there and it was silent. The only thing I could think I'm sorry, this is the way they wrote that. The only thing I could think was that the footsteps must have belonged to the voice. And I hear it again, screaming at the top of its lungs that I need to run right now. And the footsteps come back, and they're in pace with me, running next to me through the field. And at the 
missing persons case, it got me out of there. I would have been dead. That's crazy. I'm sorry I didn't read that one well, but it was written really weird. Okay, one more. Uh, Purgatory Road. It doesn't have who wrote this. During August 2018, my friends and I took a road trip from New York City to Rhode Island. None of us had been to Rhode Island before, so we were excited about the drive, especially because we had rented a Mustang convertible for it. We left a little later than expected. It was about 10.30 p.m., and since it was a busy Friday night, we decided to punch our destination into the Waze traffic app to, app to beat the traffic. Is it Waze? Was I've never heard of it before. Eventually, we started losing steam, so my friend in the back seat fell asleep, and I just kept driving along quietly. When my friend in the passenger seat told me to exit the free freeway to take a, a side road, at first driving on the unlit winding back roads was relaxing, but then the wind picked up and it got increasingly foggy and misty. I wasn't scared, just a little on edge. I thought about pulling over to put the top up, but sided against it since there were no cars in sight. Heavy rain was projected for the entire weekend, so I wanted to get the most out of our convertible. So I kept going along as normal, if not a little too fast to get back into the main roads as quickly as possible when something just shifted. I don't know how to explain it other than an unsettling, exposed feeling. I remember pulling my sweater over my legs to cover up. Then my friend up front told me to look at the street sign in the distance. It read, Purgatory. We woke up our friend in the back seat, who sort of scoffed. Seconds later, we went around a bend where a large red cross was installed on the side of the road, with nothing else in sight. We just shrugged it off as creepy. By then, we were kind of joking about and indulging in the spookiness. But around the next bend, a big truck came, hurling down the one-lane road, aimed straight at us. Luckily, my impulse was to swerve a little to the side, otherwise it probably would have resulted in a head-on collision. My friend tried to get his license plate number, but he sped off, while my other friend found the quickest route away from this particular road. We didn't really discuss what happened afterward because we were too creeped out and we haven't talked about it since. While writing this story, I decided to look it up. I spent an hour trying to retrace our route and found the little road. It was indeed named Purgatory. And though we didn't notice it at the time, Google Maps revealed that Purgatory Road was situated next to an old graveyard. Curious about this road, I researched it further and discovered that two teen girls had died there in August of 2011 and accident on their way to visit the grave of Rhode Island's infamous vampire, Mercy Brown, who died in 1892. Apparently, they decided to go for a drive down this dark, windy road because they thought it looked haunted. I think I might get to the conjuring later. This is probably going too long. Okay, let's go to the conjuring real quick. <laughs> As I swallow and sniff. Okay, this is um, on a website called History 101. I will also link it in the description. I'm hearing noises in the kitchen. So, shh, to whoever's in the kitchen. <laughs> okay, I'm reading their article. The Conjuring scared the bejesus out of the movie course in 2013. The true story behind it might even be more terrifying. In 1971, to an old farmhouse in Harrisville, Rhode Island. What they claimed happened to them was nothing short of terrorizing. Old farmhouses, I tell ya, our house is over 100 years old on a farm. Okay. I'm pausing while I'm scrolling here. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. The Conjuring True Story. It's no secret that the Conjuring series is one of the most terrifying trilogies in the 21st century. The first film proved it was so much more than just jump scares and special effects. Everything from the haunting script to the truly horrifying acting makes Conjuring a horror lover's delight. However, the film wasn't merely created to send shivers up the spines of moviegoers. In fact, the script is far from fictional. The Conjuring's true story proves how unsettling reality can be, especially mixed with the supernatural. It all began with the boar on a 
assuming Perron family, Roger, Carolyn, and their five daughters, when they moved into an old home in Rhode Island, Rhode Island in 1971, they were likely expecting to deal with some basic leaks and damages, not supernatural entities. Yet their haunting was no ordinary case of ghostly activity. The forces in their home were out to wreak havoc, more significant than the Perrons could have ever imagined weren't afraid to use them to do it. I'm telling you, farmhouses and ghosts, there's a connection. It says, um, so this is freaking terrifying. Of course, like most hauntings, nothing wild happened right off the bat. Same. <laughs> However, shortly after the Perrons moved in, they began to notice some strange activity in their home, from odd noises and rooms without anyone in them to missing household objects. Something wasn't sitting right with the prawns. And before long, it became clear that they weren't alone in their new home. Oh my god, this is like such... This is my house, guys. Okay. Soon their daughters began to see spirits from the home. It was quickly made clear that they weren't all friendly like the cuddly cartoon Casper. Before long, all members of the family began to feel the undeniable pull of the paranormal presences in their home. Sometimes the ghosts would simply kiss or brush against them. Other times, the rot reeking spirits would violently lift their beds from the ground and do other things to instill fear. As they tore down the Perron psyche, the supernatural entities began to destroy their house, their peace of mind, and their sense of safety. But considering the horrid history of the home, it's hard to blame the spirits for not resting in peace. Then it says, okay, I get why they're mad. Before the parents moved moved in, the home was passed down from generation to generation of one family, all of whom died terrible and mysterious deaths. From hangings to murders to drownings, the gruesome passing of the previous tenants may have inspired their fury in the afterlife. Of all the ghosts hanging around, the most grief-inducing with Bathsheba Sherman, the featured entity in The Conjuring. Unsurprisingly, Bathsheba was a terror far before she became an evil spirit. She worshipped Satan and may very well have been involved in the death of a neighboring child. It seems like sharing a house with such malevolent spirits would inspire the Braun family to get the hell out of Dodge. People say that to me. However, they'd invested big bucks in their home and didn't have the funds to relocate. Same. They were utterly terrified unable to escape their spooky situation. So who are you going to call for the haunted house? Not Ghostbusters. Instead, they enlisted the help of paranormal power couple Ed and Lorraine Warren. John Savas, I think, is their nephew. And he also he helped us a little bit with our house. Um, okay. Then it says, well, that sure got worse and worse. By the time the Perons contacted them, am I saying that right? Perons, Perons. Warrens had an incredible history of researching and repelling ghosts, ghouls, and demons under their belts. They dated each other since they were 16. Lorraine, a clairvoyant, dedicated most of her adult to supernatural research. Her husband, Ed, was equally as involved in the investigation of paranormal activity. The duo ultimately claimed fame after opening a case of the infamous Amityville hauntings, gaining them credibility in the community of supernatural research. Searchers. However, despite working with the supernatural frequently, the case of the conjuring home seemed to rattle them to their core more than any other. Mainly likely few oh my god. <laughs> Mainly likely viewed the conjuring as a dramatized flick, yet the Warrens witnessed firsthand the terrifying life altering events that took place in that Rhode Island home. Over the ten years that the Perron family lived in the Conjuring House, the Warrens made several unsettling trips to investigate the haunting. They uncovered the deeply disturbed Bathsheba and a number of other spiteful spirits ruining the lives of the Perrons. However, if I, if I say Perrons wrong, I'm embarrassed. Perron, Perron, I don't know. However, they weren't just there to log the strangest events in the home. Rather, Lorraine and Ed believed they might actually be able to help the Perrons get rid of and or make peace 
with their ghosts. As a result, they attempted a pretty jarring event, a seance. It didn't go as planned. The movie paints what happened in the terrifying basement scene as an exorcism. However, Lorraine actually performed a seance to try to communicate with the ghosts in the home. It makes sense, right? Considering neither Ed or Lorraine were priests, but were savvy with spirits. It was their best option. Unfortunately, Bathsheba didn't quite think so. In fact, she was intent on turning their seance into more than just a quick, quick trip to hell. And all of a sudden, <laughs> Bathsheba ultimately possessed the poor brawn mother Carolyn. The experience went down much like it did in the movie. The angry, anguished mother, possessed by Bathsheba, levitated over the ground. And yes, according to all eyewitnesses, the mom actually flew. It probably would have been pretty cool had she not been screaming, terrifying monster the whole time. <laughs> Unfortunately, after the whole seance gone wrong, the Warrens were kicked out of the house for good. Still strapped for money, the prawns, I hope I'm saying that, prawns, ugh, stuck around to put up with the chaos for many more painstaking years. Could you imagine living out the plot of the conjuring for a decade? Thankfully, the resilient family eventually saved enough of the home behind them. That is it for my long, awkward ghost story ASMR. I do hope to get better at this and maybe get a better 